I'm going to demo using colored pencils and acrylics for this piece. So I'm going to get started really quickly just using my Prismacolors to outline her features. And I have a Prismacolor Sienna Brown. And instead of, this would be instead of doing an underpainting with burnt sienna, you could do um, colored pencil. And this is especially if you have a, a harder time with paint, but you still want to use paint when you're working, you can use colored pencil in place of um, the first underpainted step. And I had already transferred this um, from the template onto my watercolor paper instead of on the canvas this time. And then I usually erase my pencils pretty well. I can still see what's there, but I usually erase so I don't have heavy pencils on there. This morning I was working on a piece that had been outlined in pen instead of outlined in pencil. So if you watch this morning's class, you can kind of see what that is like too. And I'm going to divide the arm into three sections. We're going to have um, highlight and our shadow and our midtone. And the shadow is where the burnt sienna underpainting will be. And in this case, it's just colored pencil. So I'm just coloring really lightly. And if somebody has their mic on. If they could meet that for me, that'd be great. The colored pencil in this case is dry. You could do it wet, but you would probably tear up your watercolor paper. If you did it wet, you would need to do it on canvas for the first layers. So I have, and I have a little map that I'm going to upload to the group too of exactly where the shadow goes from this morning. But on the underneath side of the arm and around to the elbow, the upper part of the arms where light would hit, so that's where your highlight would be. And then at the top of the fingers is going to get shaded because they're bending and holding onto her shoulder here. And I do it almost all the way down to where the hand meets um, the palm. And it's always darkest in between the fingers here. And then on the side too, this is still the, the sort of the back side of the arm, even though it's not, I would consider this the front and this the back. And then I'm going to grab and shade the palm, but in the front, you know, the hand of that shovel shape. I'm going to do it on the other side too. But I'm sort of ending where the shovel would end. You can do this in the face too. Instead of just um, using the acrylic paint. So I'm going to do it really quickly for you guys. You can see. And I sadly work super fast, so I'm trying to slow it down. But you can go as um, heavy or as light as you want because these are going to be the layers of shadow underneath the acrylic. And whether the pencil is dry or wet is going to change the look of it, obviously. But whether you have a thick layer of pencil down or not is going to change the look of it, too, because the acrylic is still going to move around the dry pencil just a little bit. But again, this is just uh, it's a step to do if you don't want to paint the underpainting. You can use colored pencils. And I recommend, too, if you do keep an art journal, just do a page in your art journal and, and try it out first. I'm going to show you on the face a couple of different places to shade, and I'm going to get up closer as well. I have a shading map from the advanced faces. If you guys remember, it kind of goes along the side like this. And then you can go um, sort of sideways this way, too. 
So we're meeting an area of shading to the corner of the mouth. And then we're pretending that the chin is like a circle. And you can just color to that. I'm going to do the nose. Since this is a whimsical piece, I'm not going to really um, do too much with the nose, but I will <coughs> color that Biore strip right there. And then get her eyelids and her eyebrows in it as well. From here, the amount of shading that you want to do um, is based on your own personal style depending on whether you want to do more realistic um, and less sort of dull whimsical faces is entirely up to you but it's usually in the nose where um, the whimsical versus the romantic realism that I talked about it's in the nose how like button like and doll like you make the nose is gonna make the face look more whimsical and I'm gonna show you guys that kind of on the side over here really fast if I talk about it a lot but it's a, it's a big thing on personal style. If you see um, a lot of primitive artists, they kind of do a nose that's connected to the eyebrows. And then you have, um, if you've ever seen anime artists, they do just a little carrot nose, right? And then you have in the, um, the world of whimsical art, and big-eyed art, you have the eye size and depending on how realistic your nose is, you could do a very, very realistic nose. And that would make your piece look even more realistic. And this is tiny, but I'm just trying to make a quick point. Versus kind of doing the same thing. I'm going to move it down one more. And having just a little simple nose. I'm going to pick it up and pan out so you guys can see both of those. The um, one on the top and the one on the bottom, if you can see. Those eyes are the same. The nose placement is the same, but you have like a cute one here at the bottom and more of a realistic. They're so cute, but the nose changes it a lot. Put this down so I'm not shaken. And I'm going to go back over to my girl. You can also do this um, with your um, burnt umber shadows too. So I have dark umber, and this is a Prismacolor color pencil. And I'm just going to color in um, the shadow area and outline parts of her as well. And down into the arms. It really does change it. The nose changes a lot. Another thing that changes a, a lot isn't just the eye shape, but the eye placement on the face, how high or low you put the eyes, and then how far apart they spread, too. Some um, whimsical artists put the eyes almost very corner, right next to the ears. And it's just a stylistic choice. But it really does change it. So when I talk about finding your style, these are the things that you start thinking about. You know. What what nose do you really like to see? What face expression do you really, really like? I'm just going to put shading. The shading that I'm putting in here with these colored pencils is it's very, very, very little bit. It's going to be where the um, fingers meet the shoulders here. The parts of the fingers that in the class video I actually painted on my own hands here in the middle. And then just to pull the arms apart a little bit so they look like they're on top of each other but not kind of melding into each other. I've put some shading there. I'm going to go back up to the top and the shading on the face is going to make a difference too. How much shading you do on the face just like on the nose is going to change how realistic versus how whimsical or doll-like your person looks. These you could have the same features but if you do um, 
a more realistic style of shading is going to make your person look a little more what I call romantic realist than um, like a whimsical work. And I am obviously not the expert on this stuff. It's just my observation. So we have, oops, guys, I totally missed her shoulders. Let me grab this really quickly. I'm going to move straight on to um, paint, too. We have, I'm picking it up. Sorry, guys, my cord for my camera is really long, but it's night here, so I'm casting a lot of shadows. I'm trying to turn everything out of the way. We have over here um, everything penciled in, and I'm going to get started right away adding the skin tone layer. So this is our um, burnt sienna layer. And I'm going to start down here. I'm going to cover everything um, uh, just as if I were doing an underpainting with paint. I'm going to cover everything with uh, the skin tone paint. Just you hear me over here grabbing my brushes. And I'm using the um, Apple Barrel Light Mocha instead of mixing, but you can get the same color. And I'm going to put this on screen on my fancy, fancy palette. I use Sienna Brown and Dark Umber. So it's my uh, Prismacolor equivalent of Burnt um, Umber and Burnt Sienna. This is my Light Mocha, but you can get the same color mix from using an off-white and a uh, burnt sienna. You can see they're almost the same. So you, I'm just taking uh, like a helping hand from the store to use this color. It's a teeny bit more yellow than if I were doing the um, burnt sienna and white, but it works. The camel will work as well if you guys were using camel. And then on top, I'm just painting on top of the colored pencil here. And you're going to be able to see it through the paint just like it were an underpainting with my Burt Sienna acrylic. <coughs> oh, somebody's got their mic on. I heard you coughing. And we're just going to paint all the way around. And I'm going to um, do it once. And then I'm going to pick it up to show you kind of, hopefully you can see the paint and the pencil. and whether or not you would need a second coat on your own. I'm just going to paint all the way through here, and then I'm going to do it on the other side. It is a pretty darn watery mix for this one, and it's going to depend on whether you're using canvas or whether you're using the um, watercolor paint, exactly what the mix is for you. You'll get a feel for it depending on if you have a preference for one or the other. If you have a preference for canvas, you're going to notice you use a teeny bit thicker paint. If you have a preference for watercolor paper, you're going to use a little bit thinner of paint, just because how they absorb in the canvas. Or at least I do. Let me reframe that. I totally use thicker paint on canvas than I do on watercolor paper. So. Just painting in my skin tone layer on top now. And this is mixed media. You can mix whatever you'd like. My watercolor paper is not gessoed this time. But you can gesso it. Your paint and your color pencils can move around a lot better on it. That's another thing about style, too. That's great to bring up. Just the materials you use, even if you're doing the same template that I'm sharing here in class, just the materials you use are going to make it look different. Thin, watery washes of acrylic over watercolor paper are going to look more like you're painting a watercolor painting. Whereas if you're doing um, thicker glazes on a canvas, it's going to make it look more like an oil painting. Turn it. Paint in here. Now, this um, paint, when it absorbs into the watercolor paper, there's just a teeny bit of the wax binder from the Prismacolor that's going to block the paint here. 
So you'll see as I'm picking this up, right there, that it's settling in between the spots. And I'm trying to get close, but I don't want to get super blurry in, guys. The paint's actually settling in between the um, where the pencil lay on this paper. And this is a cold press paper, but it's not that textured. It's still pretty smooth. And then over up in this hand up here, you can see as well where it, it absorbed into the paper. Let me put my finger there. Hopefully it'll kind of focus there. You can still see the pencil, and it looks like pencil there. So it would be up to you whether or not you do another um, layer of skin tone on that or whether you are happy with it. I'm going to do another layer. Marion, what did you need me to talk about? The gesso? on the paper and whether or not I gesso. And I'm just picking up paint off the side of the camera. Okay, this is going to be a quick um, lesson in gesso. So when you paint on paper, the paint is absorbing into the paper. When you gesso the paper, the gesso is absorbing into the paper. And gesso is made with um, white paint acrylic binder and calcium carbonate, uh, which is the chalky stuff that um, is makes up Tums. So the gesso acrylic binder seeps into the paper instead of your acrylic paint. Then when you paint on top of the gesso, your paint is then absorbing into the calcium carbonate of the gesso, not into the paper. Does that make sense? That's why you paint a couple of layers. So you have a, a primed um, surface that will absorb better into the gesso. So it works for wood too. You know how wood gets really porous if you paint on it? You can gesso wood and then your paint is absorbing into the gesso instead of absorbing into the wood. It acts as a barrier that will also absorb paint itself. So there are times when I want the paint not to absorb into the paper. I want it to absorb into the gesso. When I don't want a, a super watercolory look. When I want to make a painting that is easily framed, but I want to be able to strengthen the paper, you would use gesso. When I want to use a whole bunch of media on this paper, but you know it's it's gonna get scratched up by my pencils, I would use gesso on the paper. I'm just doing, guys, if you're listening to me rattle on about gesso, I'm just doing another layer of skin tone over the first one. So it's the same color. It looks a little lighter now because it's more opaque. And I'm going to do the other side. Did I answer everything you needed to know, Marianne, about the um, the gessoed paper versus the non-gessoed paper? Because I can keep talking about it. Oh, I'm so glad I, <laughs> I cleared it up. I know it. it's a lot of um, science knowledge, too, on my part. But you can, if you go to the Golden website at golden.com and you want to, you know, have your brain explode, they tell you a lot of this stuff, too, on how it works. Because just so used to be made out of rabbit skin glue, and it, it would do the same thing. It would prime and prep a surface, but it's not the same product anymore. I'll grab it from the um, Golden website and link it to everybody. I get I get really big art nerd about this stuff. I love learning about this crazy stuff about uh, acrylic paints and inks and pigments and stuff. And I'm gonna paint down here. And if you use gesso, you can paint on just about anything as well. I think the only things that gesso does not um, help prime are metal and glass. Yeah, if you use the golden gesso, it is not rabbit skin glue. It's an acrylic-based um, 
and that's why they use the calcium carbonate as well. Sarah, you said your Michaels clearance out the Americana extender. Boo. I I use that because it's the cheapest one, not necessarily because it's the best one. The basics, I think the basics brand in Michaels. I'll get you this information too once I'm doubly sure. But any of the generic brands have a paint extender as well. I just chose the Americana brand because it was the least expensive. I try to keep things on the least expensive end of paint for you, especially if it's something brand new you're learning a technique with. Otherwise, I would say, yeah, go all the way to get, you know, all the golden brand things, but you would get one golden brand extender for twelve forty nine, and then you can't get any more paint because it's so expensive. All right, I'm mixing, and I'm going to show you guys on camera really fast. The um, I'm using white and this light mocha. If you have uh, bleached titanium, titan buff, off white, any of those, porcelain doll, any of them will work. It's going to change the color value just a little bit on how warm your skin tone is. So it's going to change how yellow um, or pink your skin tone is. But it's not going to matter. As long as it's the same consistent skin tone you're using throughout the entire painting that you're doing, that's all that matters. I'm eyeballing it, but I would say this was like a 50-50 mix here. Retarder is the same as extender. It's just less politically correct. You can just look at them and make sure that it is the thickness you're used to because some of them are very watery. But they all do the same thing. They're all just supposed to um, slow down the drying time of your acrylic. So we had in color pencil the shadow down here, and then we painted the mid-tone, which was the regular skin tone, over everything. And this is my highlight color, and I'm going to highlight the top of this arm, just like this. And then I'm going to highlight um, into the hands. And I talked about this this morning, too, this morning's class, but don't see the painting of the hands and the arms as painting hands and arms. See it in that three-step process, and you'll have an easier time of it. Instead of kind of obsessing over it, and I'm only speaking from personal experience here. I used to obsess over hands and arms. And then I'm going to feather that color. It's still wet. I have a clean, damp brush, and I'm after I put the paint on, I'm just going to literally wiggle along the edge. Well, that's blue. Guys, my three-year-old was in here painting right before... I started class and he got blue into my what was once clean damp brush. Let me remove that. Or not. We're just going to have a blue arm. Take two. Sorry about that, guys. I'm going to clear this up with some more paint <laughs> or a bracelet. Exactly. Everything's fixable. You do a cuff bracelet there. I'm just putting some more skin tone on it, and we're calling it a day. And I'm going to get more of that um, highlight color on my brush. And I'm going to paint along the side here. We're going to highlight. Again, this is a number 12 filbert, really large, really long um, bristles on this filbert. I'm just using the side then instead of using the flat part of it to re-put my highlight on there. Um, hello, son of mine. Oh, this is so those all people. Yeah, those are all people. You need to go. Okay, I'm teaching class. Okay, and then I'm going to blend again. I'm going to feather this edge. If you can see that, it's not scumbling. I'm just taking the edge of that paint that was there and I'm moving it downwards to blur it, and this is a clean damp brush. If scumbling is giving you trouble and it is driving you absolutely batty, you can feather instead. And so I'm going to grab more paint and I'm going to do this same thing in the fingers. Imagine the skeleton of the hands. And we're going to show you the fingers. I'm going to get closer. And then, so we have the bones of the thumb here that I would highlight. I'm getting more highlight paint. And then I get the bones of these fingers just in the middle for the highlight. And then I'm going to paint um, 
this top part of the hand here, where what I call the shovel, where the palm would be. And then I'm going to use this filbert. Filbert's best for feathering, just like for stumbling. And I'm literally going to just blend these colors in. It gives you a softer look, and so you don't have those harsh edges. But do it uh, small areas at a time if you feel like you might have trouble with this. I did it on the face this morning, and I tried to put too much paint on, and it dried before I was done. So I'm just adding some more highlight to this. And this is really easy, especially if you feel that um, you might not be able to highlight as easily with just pure paint, and just use the brush to blend. But if you use the brush loaded with the highlight, you might over-highlight an area. So clean, damp brush. Feathering. And I'm going to go on to the other side. We're going to do the same thing over here. I'm going to highlight the top edge of the hand and the area of the fingers that would have bones. So just the top edge here. And then the thumb. And the fingers. I get more paint on my brush. Here we go. And then feathering again, just downwards. I usually go in a circular motion. You might not be able to tell at home, but I am actually going in circular motion. I'm just going fast. And that stops you from having lines everywhere. So here we go. I'm going to pick this up. And here you go. You see over here where it was highlighted on the fingers with that dark pencil underneath. I'm sorry, it's not focusing so well. The lighting in here isn't great because it's nighttime. But on this side, too. You start to see the pencil underneath it just a little bit. Then over here, too, you can actually see um, where the brush stroke went. And then the knuckle is the, just the color that was underneath that was reserved. From here, all I would do, honestly, is probably just take the same pencil that I had and lightly, because it's... Um, slightly wet acrylic paint and I don't want to peel it up, I would just redefine any of my lines. That I felt needed to be redefined. I'm popping up here. And I'm going to paint in um, her face, too, in much the same way, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it. So we do a lot of faces in this class. I kind of want you guys to see um, the arms and hands more than the face. But we're going to do the same thing up here. Just quickly grabbing my paintbrush. You see my hand going. And this is my giant filbert, just to paint in a larger area quicker. A pretty, pretty watery mix for this, too. It's almost inky consistency. And does that make sense to you guys? You can let me know in chat, too. Saying heavy cream versus inky, when you're actually painting, do you, does that make sense to you? Or am I just talking crazy talk? <laughs> let me grab this paint all the way up here. And the paint into her nose and lips, too. All right, good. And down into her neck and shoulders, some, too. And the mix down here is going to be a little more opaque because I don't have any details that I really need to reserve. As I'm painting into the hand. 
with this. I'm just trying to be really careful, so I'm just using the tip kind of chiseled on there. And then we're going to get into the colored pencil, wet and dry. I did this AM class here. I was like, man, I just, I can't stand leaving her face unpainted if I'm working on the butterflies in her hair. So I had to paint it in. I'm going to pick this up really quickly. And you're going to see the difference between um, the bottom here in her chest was more of a heavy cream consistency and the top here was more watery and you can see how, how it's already dried and sort of absorbed in the paper. It's really splotchy. You got to be um, kind of patient with doing layers like this because you can control them better but you have to do more than one. So I'm going to grab some more of my skin tone color and paint into her face a little bit more just to even out that skin tone and you can still too see that pencil shadowing underneath but you didn't have to go through and paint it if you um, really don't feel like you're that strong a painter. If you want to get better as a painter though I would definitely recommend painting the underpainting in because practicing with your brush strokes for outlining and for shading will really, really help build up your muscle memory. And you'll learn too, um, I'll show you guys on the side here as well, the line quality of how much pressure it takes to do a line like that versus doing a line like that. Oh, I hit the camera, sorry about that guys. And how much, uh, the, the way you're actually holding the brush and the poise of your hand, just weird stuff like that that you actually have to do to see is way different to get a really continuous line. I need more water to get a more continuous line over here. But you can do thin to thick like that line is. And it makes a difference, it makes a big difference, especially in the shadows with how refined your piece looks. You can still have a whimsical style that's more refined because your line work is more refined. So it's just something to think about um, when you're painting. And of course, if you're just frustrated with all the painting too and want to play with colored pencils for a while, do that too. Getting this paint in here all over. And I'm going to quickly add um, I think some pink into her lips because they're bothering me. <laughs> Looks like she just put pancake makeup all over her face. And it's going to add pink to the bottom lip and pink to the top lip. This is why I don't like lining lips, and I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to clean off my brush first. I talk about it sometimes, um, how I don't like that lined look, so I don't usually line my lips. Instead, what I do is I color in my lips with the pink color. And then I'm going to line the middle. So I've got the top lip done, and I'm going to put the highlight right here in the bottom lip, and then I'm going to line in the middle. You guys are going to see what I'm talking about really, really quickly. I divine, yeah, exactly. And the difference is actually called, um, it's rendering versus modeling in the fine art world. I like to define them versus, um, by modeling, by painting in a shape versus outlining the shape. If you ever see how I get really plump lips, this is how I do it. And then the other part, and I'm going to get a thinner brush, too. <laughs> I just loaded that brush, but I'm changing my mind. This is um, Burnt Umber on here. And I'm going to paint, I'm not going to go all the way to the ends over here with her lips. If you see, they're kind of in the middle here. But I'm going to put a little dot over there and a little dot over here suggesting where the lips would end. 
and then as thin of a line as you can humanly draw. So I've got this tiny little line at brush. Paint the center of the lip in. It's a U shape. And I actually made a, um, a reference sheet for this so I can put that in the group as well. Paint the U of the lip in. And then it's kind of like a tilde. The upper left hand corner of your uh, keyboard is a tilde next to the one. It's a shape like that. That's what I'm going to paint kind of in her lip. So. On that side and on this side. So let me get my fingers in here. Depending on whether or not you curve the end upwards, makes her look more like she's smiling. And then this end curved downwards and she looks more solemn. So I'm going to use my brush to cut that in half for you guys so you can kind of see smiley like a Mona Lisa smile anyway, and more solemn, like she's being thoughtful. So that gives you kind of, I hope, just a good idea of seeing slight changes in your brush strokes are going to change the way your girl's face look. And then to keep it even more pouty, I'm going to use some paint instead of my color pencil, but you can use color pencil too for this if you're going for pure color pencil. To shade right underneath that bottom lip. I'm going to grab some more water and I'm going to feather these edges out to make them softer. Following this circle that I had drawn earlier in here of her chin, it gives you a really, really patty lip. And then the highlights are the last part of these lips. And I'm just going to draw in a U shape of her bottom lip. I'm just going to draw some lines with this tiny as anything brush and then I'm a lightly line on top of not outside of the pink of her lips and it's just going to make them look really plump and round so I'll pull that up so you can see and it's an easy way to get really round lips for her nose because I am um, a lazy person and I don't like overly defined noses. I'm literally just going to paint in her nostrils. And you guys are going to see how this changes the entire look of the face versus doing uh, um, a realistic looking nose. So that's the filter. Can you see that? Easiest nose in the world. More defined lips. She gets more of a doll look to her. I'm going to quickly paint in some eyeballs, and because I have pink here, she's going to get pink irises. A great way to get more ghostly looking eyes is to not outline the circle of the iris. So at the top here, you see I put a bunch of paint, and then I just painted the circle of the iris with the same color the iris is going to be. By outline, I mean don't outline it in um, a dark umber, black, or burnt sienna. And then I'm going to feather. This is a clean brush. I'm just going to pull the paint downwards. And so you create a gradient effect in her eye. That makes it look like I did something super special to get this really cool look. And in reality, I was just painting once, putting the paint down. And then I'm going to grab a clean dry brush or I'm going to dry off my own brush. And I'm going to blend that color downwards. If you get too much paint anywhere that you do not want it, clean dry brush. And just move it where you need to remove the color. Do you see that? I actually kind of highlighted the eye by pulling out. It's called lifting out, pulling out the paint. And then in the middle here, I'm going to send a paint in her pupil. To make her look um, wide-eyed, don't add a thick 
eyelash to the top. Right here is the thick eyelash line I'm talking about. You see that? It gives her a more kind of half-lidded, sultry look, whereas on the other side, I'm going to pull the paint. It's just an open, rounder top of the eye. So this eye is flat. This eye is rounded. Simple, and this is talking about line quality again. Really, really, really simple brush strokes like that, especially in a small face, is going to change the way the entire face looks. I'm going to add in some eyelids here. And some eyebrows really quickly. And then we're going to move on to wet colored pencil. This color I used to line was burnt umber. So I had um, burnt umber and burnt sienna in paint and burnt umber and burnt sienna in colored pencil too. I just chose uh, paint colors that complemented my, or excuse me, I chose colored pencil colors that complemented the paint that I usually use anyway. So I'll pull it close. That's burnt umber right there. And then her eyelid is burnt sienna. It's going to look darker because it's up against that pink. I'm going to grab some colored pencils now in bright colors because we're at um, about 841 here. And that's perfect timing for us to get started on what color pencils. If you do have any questions that you want to see, um, you can let me know in chat with the wet colored pencil and the acrylic on top. Otherwise, I'm going to just keep plowing right ahead. And then you can hear me, I hope, in the background moving my color pencils around. I'm going to grab, I'm off camera, I'm grabbing stuff and put it on here. I used, um, this morning I used a couple of glazing liquids. This is my acrylic glazing liquid by Golden and it's a satin. And then I got um, Americana Glazing Medium. It's like a cheap version of that. And there are generic and more expensive versions of glazing mediums in between. The cheaper ones dry more yellow. The more expensive ones dry clear. This is just the clear acrylic without the binder. And then you can, if you want, take any color color pencil that you like, get the tip wet, and I'm going to pretend this is a palette. I'm going to color all of the wet color pencil there and mix it with my acrylic glazing liquid to get a sort of very washy color of that paint. And it, I'm basically turning the pigment of the um, color pencil into its own paint. So I'm going to do that down here in a better color pencil for you to see. I've got a color pencil. And I've got the acrylic glazing liquid here. And I just made a very light, oh, let me get some of that paper out of there, wash here that you could use instead of just coloring with colored pencil. And I'm going to add some colored pencil details. I'm going to do, this is dry. And then we're going to get some water on it. And up here is wet. This works better on canvas because the um, canvas tooth, the actual weave of the canvas eats away the colored pencil more and actually leaves more of the pigment down. And this works obviously better with the Premier Sister Wax here than it does with the very fence. So I have the wet at the top, the dry at the bottom. And I'm going to take some of the acrylic glazing liquid. And you can just move around the paint if you want to blur it. Or pardon me, the pencil if you want to blur it. Adding this acrylic glazing liquid is also going to stop it from lifting up and moving around with later layers. Then I'm going to grab it again, and I'm going to show you on the dry. It doesn't really move around that much. I can see a teeny bit of blur to it, if you guys can see that teeny right there. Just a little bit of blurring. Not so much, but it will also stop it from blurring later. 
So depending on the look that you like for your painting, you can use wet color pencil or dry. And it works also in um, on top of acrylics. So you can go back with wet color pencil on top of acrylic. Or obviously you could do dry too. You need to dry on top of the acrylic, depending on how illustrative, how mixed media you want your piece to be. I go back and forth when I'm doing my own work. Nothing's as cut and dry as any of the, I'm going to get closer for you guys, any of the lessons that I do. Because when I'm doing my own work, I'm just going for something I like. So I'll go back and forth a lot of times with layers of colored pencil, then layers of acrylic, then... Um, paint markers, then writing, then stamping, or what have you. This is wet over here mixing into this green. So you can get different looks. It's a peacock green in there. And then I'm gonna, instead of dipping it into water, I'm dipping it into this glazing liquid to make it wet. And this is a very thin, so you can see, depending on the color and how um, saturated the color is, you can get a pretty decent watercolor look to your pencil. And of course, you can also blend colors together, too. You don't have to just stick with one color. So I'm going to grab a lighter green, and I'm just going to blend it together. You need to be careful if you're not using canvas or just sewed surface, adding all this water and then coloring really hard like I do, you will bring up the, the fiber of the paper and that's why you would gesso your paper before working on it. It will protect the layers. I have that in there. And then of course if you do want to use a brush, you can also paint in there. And I'm just taking the color that I created with the acrylic liquid, glazing liquid, and the um, pencil, and I painted it elsewhere. Do you have any other questions that I can um, talk about before I go on to painting with colored stuff? I use both the cheap brand and the fold -in. Right now I have uh, Liquitex Clear Gesso and the cheapest brand of white gesso that I could get. I go through gesso very quickly and I find that the quality for me um, is almost the same. So I use the cheaper stuff usually. You have to be careful though, if you're at the store, um, Gesso can go bad, and it gets a really funky smell, as as well as um, acrylics too. They can they can go bad, so you got to make sure. And it's weird, but if you get it home and it has a funky smell, take it back because it's kind of gone rancid. When acrylic goes bad, it also gets those chunky threads in it, especially the cheap stuff. So just be careful, and you'll know right away because it smells like. Um, almost moldy. So I'm drawing on this side with a dry color pencil, just some hair strands. This, if you guys wanted to know how I do white hair, this is a really easy way to shade for white hair. It's my favorite hair to paint. And I use, um, I like to use cool colors in white hair, so purple and blue work perfectly for me. And just draw them in really quickly, just strands of hair, all in dry pencil. And then I'm going to color it in, in just some spots. There's no trick to hair with me. I just draw in wavy lines because I like doing wavy hair. And then I just color in areas of shadow. And then I treat it just like I did hands and arms. Shadow. Um, mid-tone and highlight. But I may do those steps a couple of times. And I'm going to get my paint and I'm going to grab um, well I did say white so I'm going to grab my white paint. I'm going to take care of that. My favorite thing to do for Christmas too is to gesso a pair of canvas um, sneakers. 
so you get a pair of canvas sneakers and if you gesso them you can paint on it with acrylics and I make my sisters um, really fun and easy customized shoes with whatever they're into at the moment so when they were younger it was all cartoons and as they're growing up it, it was Harry Potter's shoes one year and um, Wonder Woman shoes another. I have three sisters. So just so will help you prime any surface. You could get uh, tote bags or aprons or anything like that too. And you could paint any of these designs on those. If you'd like the paint to um, act better on fabric, there's something called textile medium. It's in the craft aisle. And I believe Golden has some too. And it makes your paint softer and more flexible when you're painting on fabric. So I'm painting white over my lines. And you can see they're not moving around it. But you do see them underneath. You might want to check that, Sarah, your gesso. It might be OK because it's still sealed. Over here in this side, you see where I shaded with that blue, and I've got the white paint on top of it, and it's going to move around just a little bit. So just like the you saw with the acrylic glazing liquid, the, the dry pencil moves around just a teeny tiny bit. And I'm going to paint into the rest of this hair really quickly now. And then on the other side, I'm going to show you with wet colored pencil, too. And grab over here. I got my just my water. I'm gonna do some pencil strokes that are wet. You don't have to do this obviously with just butterflies. You could do this on the face for your shading of your face, like we did with the advanced faces lesson. You could do this in hair. You could do this in the background. I think it would look cool if you have if you like your handwriting. You could do this with your own handwriting in your art journal. And then since it's wet, I'm going to go ahead and paint right on it. And it's going to move a little bit more. And I'm going to get more like a, um, a glaze of color on this side. I hope on camera you can see that this side, the wet pencil is moving around a little bit more. So you don't have to go through and do a whole lot of layers of um, highlight and shading to get this color variation. And then I'm just going to go through the middle and paint in highlights really quickly. And paint over the top of here. And if you guys have any more questions, let me know now. So we're going to start wrapping everything up. We've got about seven minutes, but if there's something that you would like answered about technique or materials or anything, let me know. I'm going to pull this closer. I hope you guys can see this right here. See this pink with the white paint? This was the wet color pencil. It moved. I hope you guys can see that. It moved just a little bit to get a variation of color. We're talking about composition. So the composition of this piece, and I talked about it a little bit, is um, centered on the on the actual paper. And I'm going to pick this up to show you guys. So not move it around so much. And with a uh, centered composition, you need to add interest. So one of the things that adds interest is the cross of her arms. Your eyes look at X's. Your eyes look at diagonals. Your eyes get stuck in spirals. So the interest in this would be this right here. This um, We have this crossing of the arms. And then your hands in any piece, hands point at things. And your eyes follow them. So these hands are pointing upward, and that's why the hair lays, do you see that, next to them. That's why she doesn't have shorter hair. So it's pointing to the hair, and it's going back around. When you're doing your own 
pieces, your own sketches um, by yourself. Just think about if you have just a, a face, say, on a background, tilt the head a little. Do something to add a little bit more interest. That's why I do a lot of wavy um, hair. It's because it adds visual interest. With composition, mostly you want to just keep the eye moving around the piece and seeing all the details. And this one, since it was such a centralized piece where it is kind of just a figure in the middle, I put a whole bunch of butterflies in the background and everywhere to give a lot of color and movement. I'm going to pick up the... Um, the piece from the bonus template, so I can talk about the composition on that as well. It's the same sort of idea, but it's a three-quarter face, so it gives a little bit more interest. And her hands are touching something. So this is the first thing you usually look at, is the face and the hands. And then, just to keep it from being, you know, your eyes central, like right in this area, because you're going to look at the eyes and you're going to look at the hands, the butterflies are drawing your eye up and around and then your eye will continue around the piece. So when you're working with composition, adding other elements that um, match your painting outside of the figure, even if you're just working in your, um, in your own art journal, this is the piece from this morning. Adding other elements to the composition help eyes move around the piece, and that's basically what you're trying to do. So here, and I'm going to pull back, Oh, look at my messy desk. The ones that are darker are the ones that your eyes can be drawn to, and the other ones are going to be in the background. But it's a whole lot of stuff going on. It's kind of exploding out from her, and that composition looks um, more energetic than this one that doesn't have that. This one looks more calm. So adding more to your composition will also change the feel of the painting. It's something you have to practice with. There are um, mathematical breakdowns of pieces, you know, like um, rule of thirds and um, I don't necessarily go through all of that because you kind of know. You get a feeling that the piece just looks good. So I'd rather you trust your intuition but I can get you the information on compositional rule of thirds because you get like the whole piece is divided into three here. So one, two, three. And on the line where it's divided, you have the eyes and the hands too. Weird things like that that got beat into my head in art school <laughs> that I don't particularly use, but they show up anyway. So I'll go ahead and get you um, the boring mathematics of it. Mostly, I just want to let you guys know that if you're thinking about composition, just think of where you're putting your hands um, and make it a little more dynamic by changing the tilt of the head or adding some background elements because you're working so hard to get this beautiful face and then you have a blank background. So you want to have stuff moving around in the background. Are there any other questions now that I rambled on about composition for a little while? If not, we're going to go ahead and end it. All right, Sarah. Well, I'll go ahead and sit, uh, put that stuff in the group to them. We'll get some fun facts on composition so that you guys know the why, not just see that it's happening. And I'll see you guys um, in the Facebook group. Share any work that you do if you want. Um, any feedback, because you know I can't help you unless you ask for it, and let me know explicitly that you do want feedback, because I am more than willing to help you guys get better. And I'll see everybody later. Bye, guys!